Welcome to the Bernie's Bootlegs Podcast, where we explore the stories of successful musicians and share their perspectives on being an artist in a digital age. I'm your host, Kenny McCabe, and let's get into the show. Today's episode of the podcast is brought to you by you. If you would like to support the show, head over to berniesbootlegs.com forward slash support. Every contribution will go towards the production costs and overhead of running the podcast. Your support is greatly appreciated and will ensure I can keep making episodes into the future. Thanks, everybody, and enjoy the show. In today's episode, we're speaking with saxophonist and composer Alex Loray. We discuss his appearance in the YouTube series The Working Musician, his upbringing in Florida, his mentorship under Bunky Green and George Garzone, his eventual move to New York, practical tips for improving your technique, his advice for someone wanting to follow in his footsteps, and much more. You can find Alex on his website at alexloray.com and also on Instagram at alexmloray. There were a couple small audio and video glitches in this episode, as you will see and hear, but overall, it's still very listenable, and I promise that the quality will improve in future episodes. And so without further ado, I bring you my conversation with Alex Loray. All right, guys, I'm here with Alex Loray. Alex, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me. How are you, dude? Doing all right. Um, yeah, a nice early morning uh, today, so everything is uh, so far so good. <laughs> yeah, man, I always kind of like the the morning podcast because it's kind of like um, you got to get kind of a, a clean slate, like it's a, it's a fresh day. You know, I find that um, it's, it's sometimes easier for me to focus because you don't have everything that happened during that day floating around. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I feel similarly, I, I prefer to get a lot of my work done practicing and writing and want to actually in the morning, I'm, I feel like I'm more of a morning person rather than a night person, which probably makes me not a great candidate for being a jazz musician, but, um, you know, it's, it's just part of the territory, you know, and I'll, I'll take what I can get, you know, definitely. So one of the, uh, contexts in which I'm sure a lot of people watching slash listening to this have seen you in is this YouTube series, which was done a couple of years ago, which was pretty well done, in my opinion. It was called like the Working Musician, and I'm sure you know a lot of people you know saw this kind of circulating around. And so I would love if you could give us some context of how that came about and what it was like to have those folks like following you around. Because if you guys haven't seen it, go look go look up Working Musician, and I think it's like a seven part series or something where they follow you around and uh, they have interviews with you know your cohorts, uh, musicians, co-workers, talks about you doing real estate, like kind of just follows your life. So I would love for you to give us some context about that series. Yeah, um, it was a, you know, the filmmaker did a really wonderful job. Um, this guy, Joe Rubenstein, who is a, a really, he's a great pianist actually, and a filmmaker here in the city. And um, it was actually like by pure happenstance that I kind of fell into that situation. Um, a good friend of mine, a pianist, Jeremy Siskind, somehow knew Joe and uh, knew Joe was filming this series. And, and uh, Jeremy had referred a bunch of his musician friends here in the city to go and essentially audition for the for the series. Um, so I remember it was like it was like a snowy, a really like it was like in a snowstorm in January when I had to go to this office building in Midtown. And Joe was kind of set up with one of his assistants and um you know, just basically cold interviewed for, for this thing. I had no idea what it was going to be. Um, I think originally he wanted it to be kind of like a intertwined series with a visual artist and an actor or an actress, kind of like depicting different, you know, career paths and the arts in New York and basically trying to just get a more realistic everyday look at what, uh, an artist's life is like here in the city. Um, and yeah, just, it just, I, I think I just happened to be in the right place in the right time where, you know, I was getting ready to release my first record and I was running around like doing all this different work. I was in real estate. I was teaching, still trying to like write and, and perform and all this kind of stuff. And um, I guess he just he, he felt compelled by what I was going through at that time. So he chose me for the series. Um, and then, yeah, he, he essentially just kind of followed me around for the next six or so months, just and everything that I was doing. Um, and I, yeah, again, I think he, he really captured the essence of the craziness of that time period, um, what I was going through. Um, and I, I try to tell people who, who see it and, and, um, reach out to me. It's like, well, that's, you know, it's not about me so much. It's just kind of like, 
that's what all of us have to deal with in some way or another. Like when we first come to the city or when we get out of school, especially if you go to music school and you get out of music school and you're in New York City, it's just like, okay, you have to make money and pay rent and cover all of these bases before you even start to think about like, you know, creating and doing all that kind of stuff, you know? Um, so, uh, you know, I had a lot of really great feedback of people, you know, saying thank you for like the honest depiction of what it's like. You know, a lot of people often have a romanticized view of New York of like, I'm going to move to New York and be a musician and blah, 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 you know, myself included, you know, growing up in Florida, I was like, I got to get back to New York. You know, that's where everything's happening. And then, uh, I don't know, you know, as going through music school, it's like, there's really only so much they can prepare you for. I mean, you, I know that a lot of conservatories and schools have like these artist seminar workshops where they teach you how to write grants and they teach you how to get your bio together. But like that really only goes so far because because as soon as you get out of school, it's like the rugs pulled out from underneath you. And unless you have some sort of financial support system that's able to help you, it's like, oh, shit. Now, like, regardless of what degree you got from what school, now, like, you're one in however many million people in New York trying to, like, make it, essentially, you know. Um, so, I, yeah, I'm, I'm glad I'm glad for that for that experience. You know? Yeah, man. And I can guarantee um, folks out there they're going to have a hard time making their rent if they're trying to play uh, standards gigs at restaurants for forty dollars, <laughs> you know. So the, it's not, the, the hustle, yeah, the as wages, it were. The wages have not gone up, and there haven't been a whole lot of uh, new gigs that have been added. So yeah, just more and more people keep moving here, and you know, if anything, things are you know kind of slimming down a bit. So it, yeah, it just gets harder and harder, and people have to just kind of be creative in the ways that they get around and support themselves, you know. Um, definitely, I, you know, I, I feel like creative. there's a, yeah. And I, I think there, there has been some sort of stigma, uh, associated with like having another gig, um, outside of music while being here. And I, I really try to encourage, you know, any of my students or any students that I meet along the road or whatnot that like, if they want to do it and that's something they have to do, like, don't be discouraged by that. Like that doesn't discredit you or make you less of an, an artist or a musician because you have to like do something else that helps pay your bills you know that's it's not a reflection of like oh you're not you're not a real musician because you you know work at this restaurant you have a coffee shop job or something like that you know um and every year that i've been here this is my 10th year now in new york every year that i've been here just consistently doing the work and practicing and going out and being consistent in my professional world um things get a little bit better you know people can rely on you they they get to know you they get to know you're playing and uh things just i from my experience, they every year gets a little bit easier here, you know. So it's you know you just kind of have to stick it out and be consistent. I think. Yeah, man, and uh, you know, hopefully for for most people, it's it's kind of a, a steady climb, you know. Um, you know, you sl- you slowly get better stuff, and then your friends hopefully also slowly start getting better stuff, and then uh, you give them the better stuff, and they give you like uh, their better stuff, and so on and so forth, you know. Yeah, exactly. Hopefully. I mean, nobody really talks about it, but like you know, the people that you go to school with are going to be your colleagues when you get out of school. So if you have like beef or you, you know, you're an asshole to some people in, in school, like you don't know like who actually is going to like potentially hire you for a gig or you want to hire once you get out of school. So I think that's important to keep in mind while you're kind of going through the process of like, just be a good person and be kind and, and do your work and, you know, just keep, yeah, keep that in mind. Um, for your future. And a point that I always like to make is that there's really no pride in being broke. And so if, if not being broke means that you have to play, you know, a couple wedding gigs a, a month or, or anything along those lines, pop music, um, commercial gigs, as, as they're sometimes called, or if it means working a real estate job or working at a call center, like a, anything, you know, if it means not being broke, then I say go for it. Definitely. And, you know, like, yeah, when I graduated MSM, I immediately got a job at a bakery, you know, Uh, I was working at a bakery for about five or six months. And then, yeah, I was in real estate. And then I transitioned to being like a piano rental and leasing salesman or, you know, manager or something like that for, for a little bit. And I don't know, I can tell you after having some like actual day gigs, playing a wedding gig is like the easiest thing in the world. And I know like a lot of musicians, I guess just not having the perspective of like what it's actually like to work in the, uh, 
the other workforce as far as what most people have to deal with playing a wedding gig just like i don't know yeah it's sometimes it's a long day but it's like you're just playing your instrument and usually pays pretty well comparatively to like working an hourly job at a salary or something like that you know it's just i don't know it's kind of cake so i i you know it's it's always good to to remain humble and keep things in perspective as far as like yo you get to play your instrument for your living like that's so much more than anybody else gets to experience you know um yeah, yeah, man. I'm I'm sure that it's something that musicians hear all the time. Um, I definitely hear it. You know, people who are doctors or lawyers or they're in the kind of uh, that kind of world. They always, um, when you tell them that you're a musician, they're always a little bit jealous a lot a lot of the times because they're just like, wow, like you get to play music, like that's that's incredible. Like you get to to do something that that um, you know from their point of view is just like super super fun. So I think um, definitely it's important to not take it for granted. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and again, like when we, when that's all we know, it's easy to kind of get dark on it because we just, we think immediately of the top of like where we want to be rather than the process of what it takes. And yeah, like I feel like I've had experiences throughout my, uh, you know, kind of like throughout my school life where I was like getting really dark and I was considering quitting, you know, in like undergrad and whatnot. And then I would always just have these like little encounters with people. Yeah. Like my dentist or like somebody else who, when they heard I was a saxophonist and that's what I was doing, they were like, really? Like, man, that's so cool. I wish I played an instrument or I wish I could do that. And it it just kind of like reminded me like, oh yeah, like you don't want to be this guy or, I mean, not, you know, I'm sure they're very fulfilled, but just, you know, we, we get to just do what we've always done for a living, you know? And I think that's really special and it's really, you know, it, it's really positive to remain grateful for that fact that we still get to play music, you know, something that we've loved forever. Um, and just to try and keep that flame going you know? yeah man so i'd love to rewind a little bit and kind of discuss how you got to where you are today so you are from florida what is florida like <laughs> um florida's kind of crazy actually um i i was fortunate um in that i i went to kind of a like a an arts and leadership magnet high school um where we had a lot of experience in in traveling with like the wind ensemble and the jazz band and it was actually a very big marching band program so it it was like very uh you know we're traveling all over doing these crazy competitions and whatnot but but they were very nurturing in in their uh ability to to really help us kind of get the the most out of what we were trying to do um and you know there were some really amazing musicians in where i grew up which was like the tampa clearwater st pete area um I got to study with, you know, some faculty over at the local colleges, but also there were some really older musicians who I got to spend time with, like, um, you know, trombonist Buster Cooper, who used to play with Duke. He would have like a Friday and Saturday gig at this place down in St. Pete, and I would go down and then sit in with him, along with this bass player, John Lamb, who also played with Duke, and, and uh, you know, Chick Corea also lived, I don't know if he still does, but he lived in Clearwater at the time, and some of the programs that I did in high school, like he would come in and I got to like work and play with him. And so I, you know, I feel like it was a really great environment, even if I didn't fully understand it at the time. Um, there were a lot of really great things happening around me. Um, but yeah, I, you know, Florida is an interesting place. You know, I, I feel like it has its pockets of really awesome culture and then it's pockets of not, but I guess that's kind of everywhere. Um, but, uh, yeah. I, and so once I got out of high school, I, I, I went to I was going to I really wanted to come to New York after high school. But, um, you know, the scholarship money just kind of wasn't there. And I just wasn't ready to go into that kind of debt. Um, but I got some good scholarship to some state, state schools. And, and so I ended up going to the University of North Florida, um, where I gained my first mentor in in Bunky Green, um, who's an incredible saxophonist out of Chicago. Um, and he really kind of opened my eyes and ears to like a lot of possibilities in music just I had never heard a saxophone played in that way before and he was just the warmest most joyful individual I had ever met and he was so eager to share what he was working on with me and our lessons we would just talk and listen to music and play and and you know he'd be direct with me if if I was like you know kind of not not cutting something he would call me out but it was always out of love it was never in like a weird like negative uh way you know um and he was also super selfless. Like after two years, he was like, you should probably get out of here. You need to like go to a different environment where you're pushed even further. Um, 
And, I, you know, I feel like that's that's really special because oftentimes I've heard of teachers who like when they have a student who is like really eager and, and wanting to learn more, they'll kind of like want to hold on to that student because they're, it's kind of like their pride or whatnot. Um, but Bunky was like, no, you, you got to get out of here. And, and so then I, I went up north and I transferred to the New England Conservatory of Music in Boston. Um, and there I, I gained a mentor in George Garzon, uh, who was teaching there at the time. And that was also kind of a revelation for me in the same way that Bunky was as far as like hadn't really heard someone play the saxophone in that way. And that kind of set me on a different path. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I, and I finished up at NEC and then came to New York and studied at MSM, um, and, uh, have been here ever since, you know? Yeah. So it sounds like New York was kind of always a goal, you know, starting from, you know, maybe high school or around that time. But it um, seems like you took a, a mildly circuitous route to come to New York. Um, is that is that the case? Did you always kind of think that you would end up in New York or w- was that something um, that uh, you didn't necessarily expect? Yeah, I, it was always in my it was always in my sights. Like, again, when I came out of high school when I was auditioning for college initially out of high school I had I had auditioned for Juilliard and New School and Manhattan School of Music and blah 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 um but yeah just it took a little bit longer to get up here but yeah for the I guess the same reason that most people still come to New York I just I had this idea that New York is where New York was this place where the best musicians you know around the world come to and and that's where I wanted to be to be around all these people you know um they just don't tell you about all the other stuff you have to endure when you're here. <laughs> yes, you know? and um, it's something that um, I hear often said, which is that uh, you don't live in New York, you survive in New York. And I think that, that uh, that's kind of true. There's it's definitely a very uh, difficult city to live in, to play in, but at the same time, there's just so so uh, such a high level of musicianship and just quantity and quality of, of art of all varieties that it's hard to, to stay away from it if you're very serious about jazz or another art form. Yeah. And I, I think it's I think it's important regardless if you end up living here or moving away or just coming to I, I think it's important for people to just come and, and experience it. Just visit, even if it's for like a, a certain length of time, just to yeah, experience the vibe and the energy and experience the players. Um because it's a really important perspective, I think, to take back anywhere else. You know, I, I I often think like, well, where else would I go? What you know, if I left New York? And I think that I think it's very um, it's a good distinction to to think about because when you're here in New York, you have all these people who are driven and who have probably done you know similar things to to get here, and you get to be a part of so many different interesting projects and collaborations from with you know such different people um that there's just like a wide net you get to be a part of but when you move to like maybe a smaller community that doesn't have such a a wide scene or doesn't really have a scene if you have this experience of coming to new york and and then you go to a smaller town instead of being a part of everything it's kind of kind of becomes your responsibility then to create that for them Um, i think just again having the experience of being here um, you understand what that is and what that means to to be a part of something like that. And a lot of communities don't know what that is, you know. And so I think when you go to a smaller town after experiencing this place, you have the ability to kind of hopefully try and nurture something in that smaller community that, you know, is, is something similar. And I think that's really important, you know, almost as important, if not more than just having it a con- as a concentrated place in here in New York, you know. Um, yeah, man, completely agree. And so uh, one thing that I'm always fascinated by is uh, actually musicians like family dynamics, because I feel like a lot of times there can be a, some sort of tension between parents and their and their child who wants to be a musician, because obviously being a professional musician is a very difficult career. It's not always that profitable or profitable at all. And so I was wondering if you could enlighten us as to um, if you came from a musical or musically inclined family and kind of uh what that uh uh, dynamic is like were they always supportive did they want you to get you know take a safer route and get a get a degree in something else or were they or were they always kind of on board i kind of had um i was kind of torn between two worlds so my my mother is a school teacher and my father is a chef so i i didn't come from a musical family um i have a, a cousin who's a really amazing pianist who actually lives here in the city uh he's originally from israel um but i was i guess kind of the black sheep 
of my family other than that um and that there there weren't a whole lot of musicians um and you know my mother was always supportive she just kind of saw that i was doing my thing and this is something that i wanted to do and she was she was always there but my father is kind of more traditional and old school and and was actually he was fine with it until you know i was just kind of going you know i was going through school and he was just kind of like all right whatever and then i get out of school and he was like okay like you have to come back to Florida and like help me run the restaurant. It's, you know, it's your family obligation to like take over the restaurant. You got to stop with this, this hobby. There's no, there's no careers in music and you're not going to make any money and blah, blah, blah. So he was actually fighting me for a number of years. Um, And I feel like that kind of led to me doing something like being in real estate or something. You know, I, I feel like I was, I had this tension with my father and I had this, weird need to feel like I was doing something else that he thought was valid. Um, and, uh, so that was, that was hard. You know, it's, it's hard when you have someone as close to you, like a parental figure who doesn't believe in you or, and, and, and looking back on it now, I know he, it was just out of love and he cared about me because he just wanted me to be comfortable and he wanted me to, to be able to support myself. And he just didn't understand the world that I was existing in. But, you know, I think over time, as things got better, I, I, you know, I showed him that like, Hey, look, look, I'm supporting myself with ease here, like being a musician. And at that point he couldn't really say anything because he's like, well, he's, he's like comfortable and he's fine. And, um, so he, he kind of just backed off, but I, I think it is really, I think it is really tough, you know, to really go against some advice that, you know, a, a parental figure is giving you or to really kind of, uh, rub against some, you know, something like that. Um, and not everybody, you know, I, I feel like not everybody can, uh, it, it's hard, it's hard to deal with it. Every situation is so different, you know? Um, but ultimately I think you, you have to do what's best for you. And if you're, if someone is trying to get you to like live their dream or you're trying to these other people doing something that you don't want to do, it's ultimately going to lead to some sort of disaster because you're unhappy, you know? And, um, I, I, that's a really important uh, factor, I think, to to remember is that you you really have to just do what's best for you, you know. Yeah, man, definitely have to uh, stay true to yourself despite outside pressure, and um, you know, it's definitely not always going to be easy. In fact, uh, in a lot of cases, that would be the more difficult option than to kind of just go with the flow and maintain the status quo and make the people around you happy by doing what uh, what they think is best for you as opposed to what you think is best for you. And so I would definitely want to put pressure on the conversation to have people, you know, uh, realize that it's your life. Um, it's not their life. And so as difficult as it can be, you know, you have to, definitely have to uh, be try and be self-aware and, and uh, do what, what you think is, is the right choice, despite sometimes what other people will think that you should do. Yeah. I, yeah. You have to be honest with yourself. And, um, I think one of the best pieces of advice that I was given, uh, that I still very strongly believe in that I tell people is that sometimes, uh, the thing that's best for you is not what's best for other people. And that's okay. You know, um, because the people who love you and really support you and really want you to be your best self will, will be there for you. And, support your decisions in, in whatever you do if if they believe that it's in your own best interest as well so i think that's a really important thing to to remember you know um yeah without a doubt and so um super super important topics and so let's talk a little bit about um what it looks like for you to be a musician and how that has changed over time since you've moved to new york so Obviously, when you first move to New York, um, you're going to school, but then you get out of school um, working real estate and, uh, you know, in a bakery and, and some other things, I'm sure. Um, what kind of gigs were you playing at the time? And then how does that picture uh, look now? Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I feel like I, I wasn't playing as much because, well, obviously, just being out of school and being new, I, I felt like when I was going to MSM, I wasn't really on the scene. I, I feel like I was just kind of wrapped up in school. I mean, that was a really intense program. Um, and I feel like I was just kind of concentrating all my effort being at that uh, place. And so I feel like once I graduated, then I was like, okay, now I'm actually in New York. And that's when I kind of started, you know, going out and whatnot. And, um, you know, one of, one of my first gigs coming out of school was playing with Lucas Pino's Nanette. Um, he had started that kind of the, at the end of his uh, undergrad at New School. 
And um, I started playing with them probably back in 2010 or 2011. Um, and uh, that, that was a really important gig for me uh, musically because it was just so creative and, and the musicianship in that band is so high. Uh, it was just a, a really great um, inspiration for me, I think, just to be around that level of musicians. Um, and uh, I don't know, I was doing, you know, a lot of pickup gigs here and there, you know, some restaurant gigs, but I feel like I was doing my fair share of creative gigs. Um, I feel like I've always been kind of good at, at making sure I'm, I'm playing gigs that I, that I've wanted to do. And, uh, if I played a gig that didn't go so well or for one reason or another, I made sure to not put myself in that situation again. Um, and I feel like holding myself to that, to that standard, I, I feel like the, the gigs that I've gotten have, you know, gotten better obviously and I, I feel like I've been able to play a lot of really wonderful gigs with a lot of amazing people in New York and, and I, I don't really feel like I've had to sacrifice too much musically um, you know I and I and I, th I think people when, when they see you doing that and, and holding yourself to some standard I, I feel like they respect that and and you know I don't know depending on the energy that you put out and the professionalism that you put out there and the consistency I keep coming back to consistency cuz I think it's really important the consistency that you put out you know I feel like you if you surround yourself with certain people that like make you want to be better or who are better than you like you'll attract those kind of people to to yourself you know and, and I think it's important to put yourself in in that kind of environment where it's pushing you and and that you aren't maybe the strongest player um so that's that's kind of been my unspoken motto i guess and and it's really benefited me and and so now you know thankfully i've you know since that documentary a lot of things has ch have changed i'm not doing any other real estate jobs or anything like that i you know i i just get to play uh music with some really incredible people and um I, I do some teaching, I have a private studio and whatnot, and uh, as well as doing some composing work for some people. And uh, yeah, that's that's kind of kind of the world that I exist in right now, which is I'm again, I'm just so grateful that sometimes I just think back. I'm like, damn, like I just get to do this for my life, and it's pretty great, you know. It's uh, I, I just try to remain humble and and remember all that shit that I went through to get to this point, you know, and. Um, yeah, that's kind of where I'm at these days. I love it. That's that's a great story. And so um, one of the things that uh, you mentioned is that uh, you actually have a student coming up at uh, like half an hour or so. So I wanted to ask you, what are the most important things that you have your students focus on? And obviously, you have to be personalized when you're teaching a student. You have to focus on their specific weaknesses. But are there any kind of general themes that you find come up over and over again when you're teaching uh, folks yeah, you know, I actually get a lot of students who come to me asking for kind of like basic fundamental technique uh, lessons on the saxophone. You know, I was I was trained classically, um, and so I thankfully I, I have you know some experience in, in that realm. And so when I when I teach some students, I, I really go over basics as far as tone production, um, you know, overtone work, you know, uh, overtone exercises and whatnot, um, reading etudes and, and practicing those those kind of things to work on technique. Um, because I, I think you really need a, like a basic foundation uh, to to really get to the other stuff, you know. So I, I've never been one of those teachers to be to be like, OK, here's this like sick pattern, like practice this in all 12 keys and come back to me. Like I, I feel like I, I'm I really want to talk about the basics. And once I know you have an understanding of that, then we can you know, start branching out to the other more advanced things when it comes to improvisation and whatnot, because without that initial ground floor, all the other stuff is, is going to be much more difficult, you know? Um, yeah, man. What are some uh, resources or things that you have your students work on specifically for technique on the saxophone? And I, and I know that not everyone that is going to be listening to this is a saxophone player, but right. maybe even if they are not, they can still, you know, check out some of the, some of these some of these things or concepts definitely um well uh, sax one related as far as like overtones i know everyone knows the cigar rasher book top tones for the saxophone that's a really great starting point for if you're trying to really get your sound together and overtones and whatnot um just to develop that flexibility you know and you know a lot of people ask me about extended range exercises and altissimo you know for the saxophone and, and that book is also 
important for that because yeah without the overtone series and understanding how to control the muscles in your throat and your tongue position and blah 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 um you can't really do any of that stuff and have that kind of control um another thing i like to do like i i'll have my students try and read um say like bach violin partitas um but reading them in concert you know so working on their trans position skills as well as it puts these um these etudes and these partitas and sonatas in different re- registers of the instrument, different parts of the horn that are maybe not as comfortable. Some things going in the extended range and whatnot. And I, th- I think that's a, just a really good skill in general, just to uh, practice your transposition and playing things in, in weird registers of the of your instrument that are not so common. You know, so you're you're doing things that are uh, out of your comfort zone. You know, I, a lot a lot of people when they practice, they they just kind of like you know, play over tunes, which can have its benefits if you're being hyper-focused with a certain exercise. But if you're just like improvising over a tune, it's not necessarily the the most uh, effective way to practice. So I, I try to, you know, you're not supposed to sound good when you practice, obviously. That's that's like the main thing. So you practice things that are difficult and you practice things that are uncomfortable. Um, and so I, I try to really enforce that, that, that uh, idea with my students, you know. Yeah, man, I think people will find that uh, really valuable. And so one thing I've been asking folks about, because obviously a lot of the people that I talk to um, are living in in New York, and so they have kind of the insider perspective of of what it's like to be in the city and and doing the whole thing. But, you know, the majority of people that are going to be listening to this don't live in New York City, and some of them are probably going to want to move there, you know, soon or at least at some point in the future, even if it's not permanently, even if it's just visiting, like you said earlier, or, you know, for two years or whatever it happens to be. What is your advice for someone who is thinking about coming to New York City and trying to be a musician? What are some important things that maybe you wish that you knew before you came here? If it's possible, I think it's uh, important to uh, have maybe at least a, a few people that you know already up here in the scene who can introduce you to people and just kind of get you started in a certain area of it. Um, music school is, is good in that regard because you have an automatic introduction to people who are here and you become friends and colleagues and you grow with them as, as you stay here. But coming here cold, I think it, it's helpful to know people who are already up here and kind of involved in some things. So I, w- I would say make, you know, if that's possible, trying to trying to do that. And, um, you know, just financially, if, if it's possible, just to have some savings because New York is expensive and uh, there's a lot to, even if it's just for a short amount of time, it's, you want to be able to experience as much as possible here, like go out and see shows and, and, and whatnot. And so you want to be able to have those kind of resources to experience those things while you're here. Um, so yeah, just if you, if you can have some connections to musicians that are here who can show you around and then not have to worry about, you know, scrapping for change while you're here, that, that would be really helpful. Yeah, man. I think those are two things that are crucial, honestly. I mean, if you, it's very difficult to move to a city if you don't know anyone. It's very difficult. You know, yeah. Give it a try sometime. I bet you'll have a you'll have a difficult time. And I mean, maybe, maybe you'll probably be able to make it work, but it's going to be much easier to be able to make connections and expand your network if you already know at least several people before you you know go to that place. And then, of course, the savings thing is is crucial as well because New York is expensive. It is you know much more expensive than the the overwhelming majority of other cities that you could you could live in and so you definitely want to be prepared for that uh don't move here uh with no money that that's not a good idea it, it won't work out most most of the time <laughs> don't don't recommend it <laughs> <laughs> yeah man so um i would love to talk about uh what you've been up to lately i understand that you have your um i believe it's your second album out last month in September. And uh, maybe you could tell us about that and uh, any other things that you have um, going on and uh, anything that's on the horizon. Sure. Um, yeah, it was actually my third record that came out. Shoot. Um, Caught red handed. <laughs> no, that's cool. Um, so yeah, it was uh, my third record that came out um, last month on Challenge Records uh, with my group Weird Ear, which uh, features uh, Glenn Zaleski on piano. Uh, Desmond White on bass and Alan Mednard on drums. Um, my mentor George Garzone also appears on a couple tracks. Um, and uh, yeah, the the premise behind that record was just to uh, write music that 
uh, was inspired by various classical composers that I had listened to and studied over the years. Um, you know, I, I love listening to a lot of different types of music, but classical music, classical music has always given me an immense amount of joy. Um, and so I, I tried using some compositions as, uh, you know, some tools and compositions as uh, exercises to write my own compositions. And that kind of led to, I started with a couple of composers like Stravinsky and Carol Shimanovsky. And that kind of led to the idea of like, hey, like, actually, this is this could be a fun project of like taking all these composers that I've listened to and trying to use their inspiration or use their their works to inspire my my own pieces. So it led to that music. And, um, you know, the, everyone played really amazingly on it. And uh, yeah, so we're just kind of, you know, reeling off of that and um, have some fun things coming up with with Lucas Pino's Nonet. We're actually traveling this weekend to California to play at the Brubeck festival in Stockton. Um, we're also going to Chile at the end of January uh, to play at a, a jazz festival down there. Um, I'll be doing some work with, with Jeremy Siskin, uh, the pianist Jeremy Siskin's trio with Nancy Harms in February. We're doing a residency in Vermont. Um, and then, you know, just kind of working on my, my own music, kind of setting sights as far as like what what I want my next project to be with, with this group and what that's going to entail. Um, I, I still, even though the music was recorded and written a year ago, uh, you know, I've written some new music, but I don't know. I, I think it's really important to have some, some idleness to really allow new ideas to come into play. I feel like our society is always like, okay, like you wrote some music and you, and you played at this show. And now for the next show, you have to write some new music and the next show you have to write some new music. It's always like more and more, 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 more. And some people are amazing at that. Like I, I am very, uh, uh, I admire people who can just crank things out so quickly, but I guess my own process is I, I just like to take a little more time and just sit on some things and ideas for a while before I actually get some notes on the, on the page. So I'm just kind of flushing out some ideas and, and hopefully that's going to lead to something uh, in this coming year. Yeah, man. It reminds me of uh, the great uh, Bill Evans, the pianist. And uh, sometimes he would go, you know, a, a couple of years or, or more without releasing anything. And I just remember um, someone asking him like why he has why he hadn't released anything in a couple of years, and he said, "Well, I didn't feel like I had anything particularly new to add to the conversation." And so it's kind of along the same lines, you know. You definitely want to be writing music that you're inspired to write, and um, you know, some people, like you say, uh, can crank out music and just just are, are <laughs> just a machine in terms of composing and can have you know an, a new album out every single year like clockwork, but. You know, for some of us, um, myself included, you want to be uh, m making sure that you're saying something new, I think. And so maybe that's how you feel. Yeah. Or, even you know, even if it's not, I, I guess it's it's inherently saying something new if it's stuff that you've recently written. Um, but it just, just something that you feel uh, strongly enough that you want to share with the world and, and that you want to get down and, um, you know, whether that's recording you know, older music or recording newer music, you know, it's still new in the sense that you're putting it out and it's new because you're recording it today. Um, but yeah, it should just be something that, that you feel strong, strong, strongly enough that, uh, yeah, I guess Bill put it best that you feel like adds to the conversation rather than just kind of, I don't know, doesn't <laughs> just, just record it, writing music for the sake of writing it with, you know, because you feel like you have to like write something, get something out right now. Um, I don't know. I don't really believe in that concept. So, me too. So, where is uh, the best place to find the record? Um, I believe that it is on all of the usual places: uh, Spotify, iTunes, or Apple Music, I guess. And um, so, it, it's streaming on all those places. Is that correct? Yes. Cool. So people can listen to it there. Um, but uh, if they want to buy a copy, um, how can they do that? Um, they can buy a copy either on Amazon or, uh, preferably, uh, through me. Um, if you message me, uh, on my website at alexloray.com, uh, I will send you a personalized copy, which is better than Amazon. So, um, <laughs> feel free to message me and I can, I can get a CD out to you, uh, quickly. Wow. It's a physical CD. It is a physical CD. I have it right here. Not only is it a physical CD, but it has like a sleeve and everything. It's like a... Oh, wow. A dual, a dual thing, you know. That's, so that's some I feel like you don't really value. see these these days. I know. So if you have like an old car or like an old boombox or something like that, you can 
play it in there and uh, <laughs> you know that'll that'll work <laughs> exactly and um, just in general uh, besides your website um, I'm sure you have all of the usual social media Instagram uh, I'm sure you have a Facebook page so people can just search Alex Loray L O R capital R E um, yep yep and people I'm sure will be able to find you um, uh, any final thoughts or anything you'd like to put out into into the world um yeah, I mean, if I, I'm always, I, I think it's important. I guess I've I've been here in New York, like I was saying, for about ten years, and and I'm always, uh, I always try to be very encouraging to to people who have questions about coming here. And so definitely feel free to to message me if you have any questions about New York or you know being a musician here or anything in that regard. Like I'm I'm ha- more than happy to help. And uh, I was fortunate in having people who who helped me when I when I was coming up and and coming to New York. And I think it's really important to to keep that uh, kind of sense of, of uh, community and and uh, friendship going. So I'm, you know, happy to answer any questions people have. Um, and again, just, I think, staying consistent and, and staying true to what you believe in is, is what's most important at the end of the day. Um, I think if you follow those things, then things will kind of fall into place in, in a way that I think you would hope them to. Well put. Well, Alex, this has been super fun. Um, I really enjoyed this one. It's uh, it's going to be super valuable, you know, not only for the uh, wisdom and advice that you've provided here in the last, uh, you know, 35 minutes or, or whatever this is, um, but also people are going to be super grateful, you know, for the access. You know, if, if someone has a has a question about moving to New York or they're unsure about it, you know, um, putting yourself out there, you know, and, and letting people um, have access to you is, is super valuable and, you know, very, very uncommon um these days um so people are going to be very grateful for that i'm sure so thank you of course if i'm able to i'm happy to do it so um yeah thanks again kenny it's great to great to speak with you and and glad we got to flush out some of these ideas here here (laughs) (laughs) yeah man this is super fun uh stay in the line for one sec and uh thank you again cool thank you so much for checking out the podcast Don't forget to subscribe wherever you happen to be listening to this. And if you enjoyed the podcast, consider giving it a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast app. For more episodes, please visit berniesbootlegs.com.